So one welcome to Fernando Soto, still not PhD, not doctor yet, maybe soon, but uh, his PhD defender Fernando, Fernando is native of Tijuana, Mexico. He came to my lab in 2011 as undergraduate. And 2012. 13, 13, January. So, so if one, one year is an undergraduate, then we fall in love and uh, <laughs> we don't know <laughs> Not with me, we have a problem in this. <laughs> and, uh, the other guest from Dr. Victor from Vietnam, yeah. So we went with Victor and did the first year and we went undergraduate. So you did an amazing, fantastic voyage as you will see. Today, a lot of exciting robotic, micro robotic, uh, acoustic, uh, biomedical. Uh, you see this uh, video. So we'll see a lot more in the next 45 minutes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Oh. Or? You learn. Oh. How do we build a robot? That's a question I've been trying to answer to my PhD stage here at UCSD. And um, it's, hard, um, it's hard to do, I'm an engineer, I like to build things, but it's a really hard challenge. So today I'm going to share with you all my journey to, to the PhD. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit what are the challenges in the field, how the community has tried to solve them, and some cool applications we can use in nanorobotics. Well, the first thing is we need to discuss really what that robot is. If we have any robotics here in the audience, each one of them will have a different answer. So for us, for the case of this presentation, we're going to define a robotic system as an engineer structure that can convert energy into motion or into various tasks. And I really got into the, in this idea of robotics when I was very young. My mother got me to the book of Isaac Asimov, short stories. I really got amazed how small changes in technology or digital robotics really change the way we experience our everyday life, right? They're expected to uh, free us up for doing things that we actually want to do, to have more fulfilling jobs or get coffee for us, uh, but also they'll allow us to expand the reach of humans, doing things that are not possible, for example, uh, space exploration, handling toxic materials, or just doing times, uh, things that are very precise or in a different time scale. Well, um, I included the Raccoon GIF all over the presentation, so if you get bored, just try to find their six. Write it down and then I'll show you which guys. Yeah. Well, continuing with robotics, it's uh, of course uh, we have made great progress in robotics over the past years. Uh, we have a lot of good robots that are at our own scale, right? By this I mean things that we can see, we can touch, we can manipulate with our own hands. But although we have made all the progress in this area, we're still missing robots in this scale. This is also the history of the scale of life, going from DNA, proteins, uh, bacteria, cells. We don't have really that many tools to work and manipulate uh, life at this scale. So that's the idea of my PhD, is trying to create uh, the tools at the correct scale. Well, um, this idea is not new. It's been in our collective imagination for many years now. Really one of the biggest uh, pushers of this idea was Richard Feynman. In his, in his famous speech, he says that there are really no laws of physics that prohibit us from making robots at this scale. We just need to consider what we're going to do the challenge. And moreover, he says, a uh, phrase from his colleague, it will be interesting in surgery because what are your surgeons? Well, there must be some producer or Hollywood producer in the audience because soon after we released a fantastic voyage. I'm going to show you a clip. Oh, and you notice a light. This is not a fantastic voyage. This is a very popular TV show nowadays. And I just put it to illustrate the idea of this getting shrinking things and getting inside the body. It's still with us in every aspect, even to till today in our pop culture, right? Uh, the main challenge here is that science fiction. And literature set the conceptual banners of what to expect from robotics before science engineers could. So we have a very different idea of what people expect these tiny robots to do, and we can actually deal with them. But of course, it makes sense to try to do uh, robotics more in, in medicine. Just imagine all the things we could do that are not possible to do with our current technology. For example, deliver the drugs to the specific uh, target site and without less side effects. Or going into a brain like you're in the movie, and let's say you take a pill with thousands, even millions of robots, take them. You drive them to your brain and then you allow them to do surgery your body. This is the thing of why we really want robotics. Well, uh, this is a big challenge to build these machines, and of course, the first thing is scale. There's a reason why a flea cannot, can jump a lot and an elephant cannot even jump. It's just smaller things are less affected by gravity. And let's say we want to do uh, that little dog experiment, we're going to have this elephant, we're going to shrink it uh, 10 times. And what happened to its properties? The 
first thing is all the surface to the n full scale to the square. But all its volume, all the things it has to do with its bones, its organs, its tissue, all the way down to the cube. You know when you get smaller and smaller and smaller, things that have to do with volume or inertia or mass still are relevant, but not as surface forces. We can see this better if we consider uh, what it's like to live in an uh, environment with viscous forces dominating. For example, first we're going to put this small robotics um, robot in water. As you expect, it will start swimming just by moving itself back and forth. Do you expect? But when we start increasing the viscosity of the system, for example, putting the same fish in this pool of honey, let's see what happens. Nothing at all. So this is the challenge when we start thinking about these robotics at different scales. Is that it's not that gravity or inertia doesn't exist, it's that you have surface forces are more dominant at these uh, time scales. Another big challenge we have to face is how we're actually gonna build these things, right? We consider all our everything we have from phones, from cars, we're just an assembly of different parts that we need to put them together. There's some sensors, some um, motors, some uh, rigid links, some north doors. But now imagine trying to even 3D print all these single components and try to get them together. Maybe we could, but it will take a lot of time, or will be expensive, and maybe it won't work uh, 10 out of 10 times, right? You don't want to get into your car, and it works only 8 out of 10 times. So this is the challenge we also need to consider new designs, paradigms in design. And finally, one of the biggest challenges is how we're going to power them, right? Uh, like we saw from the fantastic voyage, such as science fiction, we cannot just scale down our technologies. Uh, for example, these are common things we use to power our devices. Uh, batteries, they probably won't work very well because a battery size dependent, uh, a battery power dependent size. To have a very tiny battery, we won't have very low power. Uh, and conventionally, it won't work. Firstly, because we don't have any gas station at the nanoscale, but also because of the high viscosity, we won't be able to have the resolution needed. Um, well, what about nature? Well, this may be a solution, we'll come back to this a little bit later. Well, these really are the questions we need to answer if we want to say, um, answer the question how do we build a robot the size of a we need to be able to first fabricate them. Fabricate them. It's not easy. We need to be sure we can make a lot of them. How can I power them? How can we communicate with them? We want them. Uh, we want to give these motors some information, but also be able to collect some information out. Of them. And finally, the really nanomotors. That's something I've been asking over the whole point of my PhD. Is there something that nanorobots can do that our big robotics tools cannot? Well, I hope that at the end of the presentation, I can. Try to convince you that we have partial answer for all these questions. Now, but let's start. Let's get started with the solution. Uh, the good thing about scientists and engineers is that when we don't know how to do something, we can just look at nature for inspiration. And nature itself has been uh, over millions of years has created its own nano robots or self-propelled particles, and it just they use very simple principles, right? For example, they use a proton dragon to power these rotors. They use ATP or other fuels, and they can do. Um, with this, they can start moving a flagella that will start break symmetry or a senior right stuff or stroke and recovery. So, uh, during the past uh, 50 years, scientists have taken pressure from this and have these concepts to have a uh, self propelled micro -borders. The first robotic micro robotic platform was published in 2004 in Penn uh, State, where they discovered that uh, these cold nano wires of platinum and gold can convert uh, fuels from the environment into motion. See here this example different geometries, circles, or rods. But and really how it works is when there are submerging solutions, they have a symmetric catalytic recomposition of the fuel, which creates a proton gradient like the cell, allows it to move through solution. Well, also, we can also copy the flagella of the bacteria. Robot, uh, this is a PTH storage, develop this small coil. They can go from a few microns to a little bit bigger, but they can use a magnetic oscillating field to start making rotate and move just like a of course, we can also take inspiration for our big tools. Like here at UCSD, we're very good at this rocket science at the nanoscale. Here, for some reason, just one time we created this uh, very uh, scalable micro rockets, which are composed of a hollow exterior that is inert and a catalytic uh, engine inside. What happens here is that we get uh, the fuel, like we can be using mechanical fuels, you decompose the fuel into gas, which starts expanding and serves as the thrust to generate the thrust for the rocket. Uh, well, so uh, I've worked a lot of different kinds of projects here in, in the lab, uh, going from how to power these devices with ultrasound, how to control them, use the energy, how to do these highways for micro motors, some work with chemical motors, uh, cyborgs, now with Miguel more, working more on um, drug delivery in the skin. But for the, for the time scale we 
have today, I'm going to focus on these, uh, these three applications. And basically, these are questions I tried to solve during my PhD. And it's really, now we know that these robots can move, but what's the, what we can do with them? So the first thing is, can we use these motors to start doing as a transport, a taxi at the microscope, just allowing it to move particles around? Uh, can we use the force of motors to start doing something like uh, more, uh, for example, delivery drug deep into the cyst tissue, or um, just uh, sur do a surgery or about it? And finally, can we use the motion to start uh, mixing better and enhance chemical reactions? Well, uh, for the first project, we started thinking about uh, what can we do for using this motor for start moving uh, particles. And uh, when I arrived here, most of our work was done with some either magnetic or chemical propel motors by peroxide. So we were looking for, as for an alternative that was fuel free. And this is when I came really with the picture, we started working on this kind of ultrasound propelled nanowires. So uh, what we can do is we can have an acoustic transducer and create a node in the middle of the reservoir to create a pressure node or a levitation thing. When we have these asymmetric nanowires in, in the node, it, they start converting energy, acoustic energy into motion and they move like you can see on the video. Um, well, we need that uh, we can move them, so we start to add more functionality uh, to the to the motor to actually create a robot. And we, for example, we added an equal layer, which allows us to um, guide it magnetically to where we want it to go. We also start taking advantage that this is a completely inert robot, so we didn't, need, we didn't have any effect on chemistry or something else on the surface. So we uh, coated with uh, antibodies and different enzymes to attach to bacteria. You see here, here we can have on the move capture of bacteria and different things. So uh, another thing we were able to do is because I repeat, we don't have any impact on chemistry on the motion. We grew a polymeric uh, segment on the top of the motor, and we use its uh, pH sensitive. So we also only start releasing drug when it's uh, lower pH. Uh, although we were still keep doing a lot of work, with, we're still doing a lot of work with these kind of systems. We still don't know very well how they move. So in this direction, we started uh, the next job is trying to understand how they move. There were two theories of how these motors move. First one was based on this uh, web scattering mechanism. This is just like imagining uh, opera how you have these concave chips, saying like the ultrasound waves come and uh, collect in that pockets. But the problem is that the wavelength is much, much bigger than the cavity, so it won't work. And more recently, more researchers uh, start to come to this idea of acoustic They just say when you have a particle and it's trapping no, it starts vibrating, and you create based on the chip asymmetry this acoustic streaming, different acoustic streaming patterns. Uh, but still we didn't know, so we tried to test this whole hypothesis. So we ended up with coming with the simplest uh, geometric asymmetry we could come up, is this whole nano shell. So in order to fabricate them, we just put some uh, beads over a glass leg, and we were able to uh, then coat it with different, uh, different metals. For example, we can use uh, uh, both materials like gold for functionalization, nickel for magnetic control, and we can actually uh, change the size just by using different kinds of beads. Uh, so at the end, like you see, we just do the sputtering. We can do the sputtering of EV, and then we just dissolve the dental and we have our nanoshell solution. Now, the next thing uh, was focused on uh, trying to actually understand what, how it's happening. So we, we turn on our acoustic system. We have a lot of things going on. The first thing is that we have our nodes that brings particles into place, um, but we also have some uh, flow generated by the ultrasound. So we want to identify that or motor was actually moving, not just being dragged by the other force. So for the first thing, we tried to look for a part of pressure particles that was trapped in a node, and we started to see if motors can move around. And as you can see here, uh, the motor's moving by itself. It's not just being dragged or trapped in a specific uh, pressure point. Now, we also want to be sure that it's not just, they're not just being driven away by flows. So here you're gonna see three bits that are more straight line, and in the green line, you'll see the uh, macro motor. So you can see here the motor can even uh, move independently, even against the flow. So it demonstrates that this proportion is locally convert. It's not just some um, field uh, force that just driving these particles around. Now, um, we also want to be sure what's the role of asymmetry and the motion. So we started putting a magnetic field and try to fix it in, a, in, a, in one position. So you can see here in the video, this shell is pointed the convex outside with a magnet, and we can see when we tilt it, we can have control of the dictionary. So what this means is that definitely there's an effect of shape in the direction that the motor will move. Um, we still don't understand very well how this works, but more recent work from a group, and this is a simulation that, uh, 
that relates this proportion based on the sharp edges of the shell that creates this screaming forces and now I'm going to prove that. Oh, another big uh, force we were trying to uh, play around with was, uh, sorry, another parameter was the density. We're working with these acoustic motors, we need to consider how important is this material because uh, if you use a very low density material, it won't work. Uh, we did shells with, for example, with silicon oxide, and you can see here they're just being dragged by the flow, they don't have any self proportion. After when we do it with both, you can see that they start, they can move like we're saying about like independent motion. So, what happens here is we can go back to the acoustic radiation force and see that there should be some uh, contrast with the medium. This doesn't mean that you have to have salt, for example, you need to have something very different from the medium, like a gas bubble or some very dense material. This is too that you can imagine the wave going to the solution. And if you have something of similar densities, they will just be throwing up on us. So you have an interesting effect. So now we learn we need an asymmetry, we need density in order to have this motor being moved. But now let's get to the uh, part we actually wanted uh, to test is this, the use of these motors as a cargo towing machine. So basically, we start comparing how well the, the structures can uh, be used for cargo uh, different cargos. And we can see here in the video comparison of uh, shell carrying the same size of beat than a nano wire. So, as you can see from the graph, at the beginning, the nano wire is more, a little more efficient in the way it converts energy, it's more faster. But once you get in contact with the beat, it slows down very, increased, uh, very fast, uh, very rapidly. We believe this has to do that with the case that when the particle touches the new particle, you can consider both the particle and the motor as a new body. So, with the shell, you can maintain a better asymmetry. And you will uh, carry cargo further away. Well, also, we're testing more, a little more complicated capture. For example, here, we can see this uh, shell going around and capturing the two bits. I call them a medium of capture. But we can actually start guiding them and moving around and uh, just have all this degree of control. And in this case, we captured them because the we added a nickel layer to the nano shell, which was able to carry the magnetic bits. But also, with, now in a group, we're doing a lot of work. We can use different um, different uh, chemical functionalization, or even bacterial walls, or sorry, cell walls, to capture these objects. Um, well, finally, part of the work we did with teaching is we tried to test the mobility of this new model inside cells. So in order to test it, we did uh, we take advantage of one of the best things this system has. Is that when you have this levitation plane, you can bring both the cells and the nano shells into the same plane. So you have a free concentration effect from the piecing to be on top of all these things, uh, which really has the interaction between the cell and the motor. In our case, we left them incubate for 24 hours, and then we check them on the motion. You can see here, we can have some of this nice motion inside the cell. Of course, this is still, uh, still a little slow. We need to improve the way that we move the inside cells. This is fact to the fact that the cells are not just liquid, they are very dense inside, and we can have some dampening of the acoustic waves going inside. So uh, this is just the uh, first uh, team. Uh, I want to show you that this kind of system has a lot of opportunities. For example, uh, they have a long lifetime. They will keep operating while you keep the system on. So they will keep moving around forever. Uh, also, they, you can put the turbo to low. You can, for example, change the voltage to change the speed, or you can change the acoustic uh, field to change the location where the nodes are. And finally, they are really very, very good to pre-concentrate things in one place, because you have to do the acoustic graphs. So you can get your target, your biological targets, and your motors in the same place very quickly. But of course, it, we have a big challenge with the system that is uh, transitioning to the human body. This is because when we're trying to create this standing waves, it's a little bit harder to do it inside the body because you have a uh, skin, uh, the tissue happening on the field. So it's a little hard to control in um, a very controlled fashion where this field will start going up. And also, uh, we can create some. On the side by product, for example, we have this uh, node inside the bloodstream, we create blood clots, so it will not be use that useful for inside the vein. And finally, of course, it requires some equipment, so it will be probably used in more uh, hospital settings or specialized settings. Well, for the next project, it was something I really liked that Dr. Ryan proposed to us that it was. Can we really make a more powerful tool not only be able to move around, but actually go into the disease tissue or shoot things inside tissue? Uh, so for this, of course, we work with other people, but we came up with the idea with this uh, microcap. So basically, what we have is this hollow structure that are filled with bullet. 
And when we apply an exhaustive fill, we shoot out the bullets very fast. I'm going to show you an illustration of how this will work. For example, this is a normal cannon we see every day. I have a problem with fluid. This is our microtemps. They're made of ethylene gold. We fill it with gelatin and some nano bullets and proper carbon. This is an emotion I'll speak a little bit more later. But when we apply a focus ultrasound field, we can calibrate this uh, for pro carbon emotions and create this uh, big uh, bubble and cross force you know, that's able to shoot everything out that you can see here in the SEM picture. Uh, well, how it works is the functioning system of this work is based on uh, cavitation and these peripheral emotions. These are already very widely used in medicine as drug carriers or as conscious agents. But what we're doing is we're having this stable stabilizing an emotion, that, and these particles are very sensitive to pressure. That means that when we apply, for example, here this focus ultrasound, we have a we focus just the ultrasound by the reducer into a one millimeter square area. This uh, these particles will capture. So this pressure is not enough to damage tissue, it's only good to uh, trigger the, the explosion. You can see here in this picture some um, gel uh, infused with some of these emotions. You can see how it starts expanding when we pop, pop it with the ultrasound. Again, we want to make all the systems to be able to uh, be scalable, so we make them by a template electric position technique, where we can grow different materials, for example, uh, metals, semiconductor, or polymers, into different shapes. In our case, we use graphene oxide and gold to have a structure rigidity of our structure. And after that, we can start loading them with uh, just, I call the bonds, by gelatin. And I make my gelatin and put all the cargo inside. Inside, We can put, for example, bullets, the preferred carbon, or different drugs or targets you want to deliver. After that, we just deliver this template and we have the release of these cannons. And the advantage of this method of loading everything inside the cannon is that you can put whatever you want. Uh, you can see here we can control the the number of bullets inside, but we can also control different therapeutic dosages 